My name is Robert Allen Jimison. I'm a writer originally from Shetland. I'm going to read today from my latest book, which came out in August from Taproot Press. Uh, it's a series of poems written over the course of a month earlier this year when I was recovering from uh, COVID-19, as I'm pretty sure it was, although I wasn't tested at the time. Um, the book is here, Plague Clothes. And uh, they're each um, dated, so you have a sort of a sense of the lapse of time. The first is from 17th of April, when I finally managed to get outdoors as far as the back garden. I reached the garden at last. A month of pestilence indoors, and the vegetable plot ignored is full of tiny blue flowers, all waving and smiling, signing sarcastically, forget me not, forget me not, forget me not. 21st of April, I am losing the habit of speech. Language itself grows strange. I forget the names of all I knew. Color, shape and texture blend. Those things there, what are they called? Those people, what is it that they do? How do those little words go, sense to make situations of? Soon I will only meow, or bark, or quack. My tweets will all be bird-like. Twenty-sixth of April. I don't care too much for money. Must be six weeks since it jangled in my pocket, since coins were important, or indeed notes. That community cafe where they didn't take cards, I think, when I drove home from the Festival of Poets. It can't buy me breath, nor health, nor touch now. Not even my supplies from the local Tesco, a dead commodity nobody wants, if it can't pay the cashier for a bottle of Prosecco. I dandle none, dander to the shore, nowhere to go and nothing there to buy when I arrive. Other matters matter more now, newborn values that are somehow very old and wise, precious as those four tiny ducklings that repay my real expense of energy in walking by two trembling minutes of splash play, instinctive feathery balls together frolicking. Live, little ones, avoid the crows, flourish. The 28th of April, I consider going feral. The garden had seemed a place of shame, overgrown with a sick spring idleness. The signs I made last year old already, stonework pocked with little aisles of moss, the pond a pool of rotting leaves and twigs, the fancy shop-bought windbreak broken, the lawn a sunny dandelion thick pile, the cloche an ocean of forget-me-not. Yet the cherry tree still drops white blossom, the lilac bloom still casts an aromatic spell. I check the chaos, find beauty firmly rooted, smiling as the bees fulfill their careful duties. Two tabbies prowl through long grass, catching nothing but the wind from a butterfly's wing. All kinds of creatures, most tinier than human eyes can spot, creep in this miniature universe. The soil is seething, a healthy mass of friable life, seed sprout unsown. I feel somewhat unsettled to be so little missed. This summer, maybe I should just observe, let all unfold this constant wilding. Our straight lines, close crop hedges, all that mowing, the wish for outside to be neat like inside seem wrong. Let me roam around the long grass as the cats are. 
roll about in sunshine. I know I'll heal much faster. Twenty ninth of April. I don't know where the ejector seat button is. Not that I'm anybody's martini, but this has shaken me. I realize the truisms, how tenuous our grip on life is, the dangers we face daily. And I'm no special agent with or without those fancy gadgets at the ready. I realize too how fast we're aging in living through epochal change, as if while time has halted socially, it has privately accelerated. This before and after marks another phase, another stage, for sure, but we're not there yet, the after bit. Right now, I'm lost at home without a mission or a map, no sports or car. I can't see anywhere to go, like somebody slammed the brakes and now it's all slow-mo, a freefall arcing by in milli, milli seconds towards the foggy windshield. The airbag hasn't inflated. This ain't no movie. This is a slight variation in that it's more prose-based. Um, the inspiration was one morning when I was out on the river walk and there were bicycles flying everywhere and in the midst of it, tiny little old lady with a uh, frame dot, dotting along. So this is the, from the 1st of May. I read the Ministry of Sanctioned Walking Advice to Old and Vulnerable Pedestrians. Know your cyclists, a walker's guide. In these times of lockdown, where the limited sanctioned walking areas are shared with cyclists, the Ministry of Sanctioned Walking seeks to advise old and vulnerable pedestrians on the many types of cyclists they are liable to encounter today. As you are no doubt aware, cyclist numbers have increased dramatically in recent times as, like other wildlife, they have moved in to occupy places previously filled with cars. Indeed, lockdown is the perfect time to begin to get to know these varied creatures and the subspecies you are likely to encounter. This knowledge has a practical use as well, as your understanding of their behavioural patterns will help you to avoid contact, including collisions, in these times where exercise space is so limited and social distancing so necessary. 1. The Alpha these are mostly male, though not always. Sometimes they move so fast it's impossible to tell, and sometimes the observer feels only a passing breeze before catching the briefest glimpse as they dart past. They power with precision engineering and complex gears, and normally wear black as opposed to coloured lycra. They give no warning cry when approaching, but their remarkable ability to manoeuvre at pace through small gaps between pedestrians makes collision unlikely. They have no interest in you, but are closely monitoring speed and heart rate and various other bodily matters. Learn to recognize the distinctive power, hold to your course, and you should be safe. Alphas are the ninjas of cycling, and little is known about their real lives or even whether they exist. However, the government advice is that you should feel safe around them and walk steady. Make no sudden move. They bear you no ill will. Two, the better. This subspecies shares many of the characteristics of the alpha, but for various reasons can be more dangerous. They generally possess the capability for alpha-like cycling in terms of their mount, but in most cases their performance is less physical and more symbolic. Their plumage is always highly coloured and gadgety. What makes them dangerous is a their own disappointment at not actually being alpha, which can lead them to blame pedestrians for getting in the way and spoiling what otherwise would definitely have been their best time and b, a need to be noticed which, in effect, slows their progress, and c, frustration at having spent large amounts of money on something which they cannot be best at. As a consequence, these creatures may attempt unsafe manoeuvres, 
or even orchestrate collisions for which you will be blamed. Their distinctive cry is a loud fuck you, repeated as often as necessary. Be wary. One saving grace, however, is the tendency of many bettors to ring bells loudly as they approach, warning you to step aside. Do so. These are not to be tangled with. They are looking to vent. As a stupid old person, you are an ideal target. Three, the gamma. These are probably the most common and most charming of the various subspecies, a hugely varied group, as are their mounts. Some have outdated models which regularly break down. Others are mounted on brand new deliveries which they are not quite in control of as yet. Nevertheless, the flock moves as one. In terms of plumage, lycra is not uncommon amongst those gamma who aspire to be better, yet are restrained by their group loyalty. But often the lesser examples go about in any old thing they picked up as they went out the door. Whereas the alpha is entirely solitary and the beta moves mostly in highly competitive two or threes, gammas gather in larger multi-generational family flocks which move at a leisurely pace, for the most part blending well with pedestrians, often stopping to talk or take selfies. However, they tend to be so absorbed in each other and flock-like that they take over the entire footpath and force the pedestrian to take evasive action. They do not observe social distancing as it is foreign to their nature. Therefore, despite their appealing calls, e.g. smile, cheese, slow down will you Schumacher, and fascinatingly varied appearance, it is best to avoid close contact. Their very unpredictability makes them a possible threat. Smile, but don't get talking. They like old people, as they always remind them of their dead man or grandpa. They will surround you quickly and squabbles readily break out. How do you know what color of eyes Nan had? Do not engage or look shifty. Four, the Delta. These creatures, like the Epsilon, which we will encounter in the final section, often lack the distinctive cap or helmet of the classes previously discussed. They move slowly, indeed spend almost as much time pushing their mount as riding it, sometimes due to mechanical failure or flat tires, but such is their happy disposition that they do not seem to care. They are easily distracted by any little feature of interest and spend much time admiring butterflies, bees or birds. They tend to move in couples, possibly courting, and cycling itself seems of secondary importance. Their call is a cooing, not unlike that of the turtle dove, with a repeated look. Plumage is entirely lycra-free, yet may be quite stylish if part of the courtship ritual. They pose little danger to the elderly pedestrian, but will object fiercely should they suspect any such passerby of spying on them. So if you do possess binoculars, it is best to conceal these till you have navigated a safe social distance past them. Never tut tut. Five, the Epsilon. Finally, we come to the least common and most dangerous of the various subspecies. Like the harmless delta, the epsilon often has no cap or helmet unless worn backwards. But unlike the delta, this class is almost exclusively male and do not seem to reach the adult stage except in a few rare cases. Their mounts are called BMX, mini-sized, and appear as if they have been ridden continuously since fledging. Plumage is usually dark, though ostentatiously labelled, the exception being their seasonal sporting attire, which is brightly coloured and speaks of a secret code of tribal belonging which old people cannot understand. They rarely flock in large number, but groups of up to six or seven are occasionally encountered. They are not malicious unless provoked because all have nans and grandpas, but have no concept of safety and are continually attempting dangerous tricks to impress each other. 
While they do not achieve the sustained velocities of alpha or beta, they can sprint very quickly and suddenly for short distances. They are completely oblivious to the existence of other creatures beyond their social grouping. Their cry is often hard to distinguish and endlessly varied, but notes of ya fucking dansa ya or ya cunt ya do sometimes emerge. Avoid the epsilon at all costs. Unless you address them, they do not know you exist. And if you should suddenly shatter their illusion, they may turn nasty, small though they may be. Unsheath your walking stick if you have one. Summary. In conclusion, the minister wishes to advise caution at all times and urges you to absorb the scientific data offered here, as the current phenomenon of a rise in cyclist numbers may indeed turn out to be the new normal, in which case you may have to walk on the restricted sanctioned paths in the midst of them for the foreseeable future. Until the Ministry is satisfied that the rise in cyclist numbers is stable and manageable, we must take every precaution. If the problem persists, it may be necessary to reserve the hour of 8 till 9 a.m. for your exclusive use. <laughs> so I think as I got better, I became a little bit more uh, playful and humorous. Um, this is from the 4th of May. I read the guidance on autolalia. When giving yourself a good talking to, try to emphasize the good. You don't want to be your own worst critic. Listen to yourself talk. You may be sick and tired of the sound of your own voice, but you may have something to bring to the table. Try to be respectful at all times if possible. Never curse your own stupidity. Let yourself finish whatever you want to say before replying to any points you may have raised. Never correct your own grammar. Nobody likes an inner pedant, least of all you. Whatever speech impediments you may display, just you let them pass. Stammering is perfectly understandable under such duress. If outdoors, use headphones so you hear yourself and other people will ignore you, assuming you're merely on the phone to a friend, which is, in a way, what you are or should be. But if you simply won't shut up, do call 111 and ask to speak to somebody. Uh, from the 5th of May, in the silence I hear many things. In the absence, I discovered the forgotten, and in the timelessness, I found a little soul. I'd thought it a myth or mystery without solution, but there it was. All this time, something transcendental beyond consciousness. It had no meaning, it had no message, it had no question. I would have brought it home to care for it, had it not seemed quite content right there, out in the timeless wilderness. It wants no feeding, it wants no rest, it wants no comfort, it simply is. It must be. 7th of May. I listen as the great leader issues a great decree. Many more must die, he tells them. Many more must yet be sacrificed. Brave warriors all required now to appease the monster at the door. And so they come forward, those warriors or rather they stay where they are because they can't escape as others quickly do. As the great leader orders his aid to open the gates and admit the foe, they stay, those warriors, with their carers. As the enemy approaches, Gramps with his hearing aid switched off, Great Aunt Lily snug in her bath chair, Cousin Jeff with his compromised immune system, and thousands like them. The great leader calls his favorite TV host to be reassured he'd come over presidential. 
and smugly retreats to the executive suite to watch the reruns of his speech. Then, bored, he flicks his phone onto his own favorite clip, that one of him felling that wrestler with a single fake blow, having snuck up on him from behind, he laughs. Time for the golf simulator. So many courses to choose from, but he selects one that he owns. He swings his driver, sends his ball into the water. Delete. Another drive, this time sand trap. Delete. And on till the eighth attempt sits pretty and he mounts his simulated buggy to steer off down his fake fairway. It will all be so much easier soon when he's playing for real again. And his guys are out there with spare balls, placing them right where they should land. Each shot, he always gets the best lies then. A mashy swings. Damn those bone spars. Four. The 8th of May. I look upon a distant coastline. Not so long ago, or was it long? How do we measure these things now? I stood across there on that shore and looked at where I'm standing now. It was so close then, an hour away at most. Now it's months from here at least, and I'm like a child gazing, fascinated by the thought of all the people gazing back. How do they spend their days? Do they walk the beach as I do, feeling childlike themselves, imagining the city with its spires and galleries, its shops, and try to guess when they'll wander through it next. What wonder this suspense stores up for us, for some day soon, some future yet unknown or undefined, a time when we, like children, can explore a world we'll rediscover, is immense. A foreign kingdom calls to me, an hour or months away. Fife. 10th of May. I respond to a friend's request for my postcode. My address is the whole of my world, now centered on the edge of the edge of our old world, if that still exists. There may be nothing beyond this now, not even dragons, I wouldn't know. Or maybe a matrix of actors, recorded, pretending they're politicians and the journalists who interview them, playing on loop, I wouldn't know. I can't see further than the door. My mind turned inward quite a while ago and isn't interested. It won't allow the outside in, so inside out is it. I'm here though, all the same, still somewhere down the lane. Still sane? I wouldn't know. 14th of May. I see an old man breaking quarantine and smile. Exile, his boat's called. A bonny wee westerly, but seen better days. She's been out of the water all winter and longs to be lying at anchor again. Tired of waiting for the old grey man from the island to come to take her out to sea again. He never says much. Let's the wee radio play, music from far off. She knows him though, his movement, his care. She trusts his touch. He misses her greatly as well, has dreams of sneaking down, polishing, bright work, caulking. From the top of his house, he can just see her mast below, horizontal, still, so distant, yet signaling, come, where are you? Tomorrow, he'd risk it, he'll visit. Fifteenth of May, I see a man well camouflaged by stone, for four days now, a man has faced the wall. Each time I've passed, he's been there, as if engaged upon some mammoth task of strange religious observance. And perhaps he is, 
Maybe the bucket doesn't just have mortar in it. And maybe the wall is more than stone to him. Maybe it's home, his fort, his castle keep against the virus. Who knows? He never turns to see who passes, the cyclists or the runners or just old dawdlers like me. He never speaks, but seems to want to be invisible, to find security in camouflage. And most don't seem to see him where he lurks, so barely moving. Maybe he feels too guilty being there, working outside in a public space at a time like this. That might be the very reason only the faintest scrapes of trowel escape his silence. Today, he'd reached the point where his wall joins another, a corner that enclosed him. Bucket in hand, he knelt, facing into the angle, dwarfed by his labor, attending to the end. With a prayer the martyr sets before it rains, he slowly disappeared among the stones. So the writing of the poems lasted for a month, and by the time that month was up, I was beginning to feel better, but I was also um, slightly fed up of the, the process because it had become uh, um, a bit of an obsession, allied to the desire to get better physically. Uh, this was a sort of mental corollary to that physical exercise. So the last poem was written uh, on the 17th of May, and it's called, I Prepare the Pyre. They become like plague clothes, these poems, to be destroyed, burned somehow, cast out of mind and sight. Symbols of a time I now desperately need to forget. And even forget-me-nots have their season, even their blues burn, then fade. Hope can heal, but once the healing's done, it's necessary to let it go. When that happens, you put the wish beyond your reach. These clothes have served me well. Strike the match.